Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Ontario Schools Feeds Report webinar brought to you by 880 Cities and Green Communities Canada. Uh, my name is Gia. I'm a project manager at 880 Cities, and I will be your host for this webinar. We are absolutely thrilled to launch the Ontario Schools Feeds pilot project and discuss our findings and recommendations from the project with you all. We hope you've all gotten a chance to go through the report. Um, the link to the report has been shared in the chat, so please go through it. Uh, but before we begin, I want to start with a land acknowledgement. The land I'm speaking from is the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. It is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, as well as settlers, migrants, newcomers, and those who were brought here involuntarily through the transatlantic slave trade. We remind ourselves to respect and nurture our relationship to this land, as well as to its indigenous peoples, past, present, and future. I am a settler, I am learning, and I stand in solidarity with the indigenous peoples of Canada. And I also want to go over a few housekeeping things. So this session will be recorded and we will share it with you. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end. So please use the Q&A uh, chat window, uh, the, the Q&A window to ask your questions. Uh, auto captioning has been enabled for the session, uh, but you might have to enable it uh, on your end as well to um, see the captions. Um, so today's presenters uh, include uh, Nicole from Green Communities Canada and Laura Smith from 880 Cities along with me. We will have a panel discussion at the end with the team leads from the four cities that piloted school streets this year in Ontario. We have uh, Laura Zeglin from City of Mississauga, Calway Johnson from the City of Hamilton, Rina Misri from the York Region District School Board, and uh, Roger Healy from the Kingston Coalition of Active Transportation. In terms of agenda, today we'll introduce the Ontario School Street Pilot Project and then go over our findings and recommendations and then head over to a panel discussion. We also have a Q&A session after that, so keep all your burning questions until then. Uh, to quickly introduce 880 Cities to you, we are a nonprofit organization based in Toronto and we believe if everything we do in our cities was safe, accessible and enjoyable for an eight-year-old and an 80-year-old, then it would be safe, accessible and enjoyable for everyone. Uh, I'll now pass it over to Nicole, who will introduce Green Communities Canada and the Ontario School Streets Pilot Project. Over to you, Nicole. Thank you, Gia. Uh, Green Communities Canada, or GCC, is a nonprofit association of more than 20 community based environmental organizations working together for a vibrant, equitable, and sustainable future. Our current program areas of focus are home energy efficiency, stormwater management, and active transportation. Uh, GCC has been a leading organization promoting active school travel in Canada for over two decades. And since 2017, we have delivered the Ontario Active School Travel Program with funding from the Government of Ontario. So what are school streets? Uh, we define school streets as a program that creates a car-free environment in front of schools at the start and or end of the school day to prioritize safe conditions for children, their caregivers, and teachers. School streets programs have many benefits. Uh, it improves the safety of streets for all road users. It improves the air quality around schools. It increases active travel and encourages healthier lifestyles. It lets children have more autonomy in the way they travel and therefore encourages independent mobility. It fosters community connections and sociability by bringing community members together. And it also reduces congestion in front of schools. The Ontario School Streets Pilot is an initiative that tested the implementation of school streets programs in four Ontario communities, including Hamilton, Mississauga, Markham, and Kingston, over the 2021-2022 school year. The project was delivered through a partnership between Green Communities Canada and 880 Cities with funding from the Ontario Active School Travel Program. So accordingly, Green Communities Canada was the funder and helped link the project to broader active school travel initiatives. 8 to 80 Cities was the technical support lead on the project, providing training tools and resources. And they also monitored the project through ongoing check-ins, analyzed the data, and compiled the key findings. Hamilton, Markham, and Mississauga representatives were responsible for the on-the-ground implementation of the pilots, coordinating engagement, implementation, and data collection. The Kingston Coalition for Active Transportation has been another key project on this partner as they have shared their knowledge and findings from their year-round pilot with the three teams. So I will now pass it over to Laura to share the main findings from the pilots. 
Great. Thank you so much, Nicole. So now I'll briefly outline the 11 key findings that we uncovered from analyzing the data from the four school streets. So firstly, we found that the presence of school streets do encourage walking and cycling, as demonstrated by the increase in rates of active school travel experienced at all four school street pilots. In Hamilton, there was an increase in active school travel by 7% on days the pilot was in session compared to before the pilot. The Hamilton School Street saw this increase even as the school street ran once per week. In Mississauga, where the school street ran every school day for three weeks, one school street saw an increase in 20% of active school travel during the pilot. Next, we also found that school streets support community building and create new social connections within the school community. In Hamilton and Mississauga, parents, guardians, and teachers discussed the positive impact that the school streets had on their community by providing more opportunities for parents, guardians, teachers, and even local residents to meet and socialize. In Kingston, school parents and guardians were surveyed about the school street pilot and 49% of surveyed parents and guardians said that the school street allowed them to meet other parents for the first time. Our third finding was that the school streets were able to raise awareness of road safety issues and bring more attention to child pedestrian safety within their local context and beyond. At all sites, mayors and city councilors were aware of the projects and the school streets provided an opportunity for the community to discuss road safety and bring more attention to problem areas that they identified in their own communities. In Mississauga, there was extensive community engagement that provided opportunities for the community to highlight road safety issues that they've identified within their own neighborhoods. The city continues to look at these issues even after the school street project has concluded. The school street also got the attention of Mayor Bonnie Crombie pictured on the slide, where she was able to see the importance of, this, of school safety to this community based on their involvement within the school street project. In Markham, result, results suggest that the school street may have also raised awareness around road safety within motorists. So observations of dangerous motorist behavior were taken pre-pilot and during the school street, and they found that during the school street closure periods, there is a substantial reduction in the number of drivers observed speeding and doing U-turns. Therefore, it's possible that the school street may have brought more attention to unsafe driving practices. Our next finding dispels a common concern around school streets in that many people worry that they will simply push school traffic onto neighboring streets. Results from the school street pilots suggested that this actually does not occur. The school streets in Markham and Mississauga measured traffic on surrounding streets during their pilots and found that at all three school street sites, traffic in the school neighborhoods actually decreased when the pilots were running. At all three sites, the traffic in the school neighborhood actually remained lower than pre-pilot levels, even once the school streets concluded. This can be seen from the graph on the slide, which shows traffic counts at the Hillside School Street pilot in Mississauga. This data in conjunction with the increase in active school travel suggests that traffic does not increase on surrounding streets as travel modes shift from driving to active forms of travel during a school street, which decreases the amount of cars driving in the school community. Next, we found that school streets are able to improve air quality in front of schools during the closure periods. School streets in Mississauga and Markham measured air quality in partnership with researchers at University of Toronto. The results showed that during the school street sessions, between 42 to 65% of pre-pilot air pollution was removed from the school zone, and additional air pollution was displaced further away from the school thus greatly improving the air quality at the entryways of schools and in school play spaces. Another key finding was that each school street was very site specific in terms of their design, operation and scope. 
Sizes of the school streets range from 70 meters to over 300 meters of road space, depending on both the built environment around the school and the goals of the project. For example, the Hamilton School Street was the smallest in size, however, it was designed purposefully this way to exclude the school parking lot in order to ensure that their school street was entirely car free. Other school street sites included the school parking lots within their school street um, and then had to admit certain vehicles within the closed area. The school streets also varied in terms of programming and closure times based on the needs and feedback from the community. The variation between pilots highlights the importance of incorporating the community into the designing and planning of each school street to ensure that they work best for each unique context. Next, we found through interviews with our team leads that it's essential to have a plan for evaluating the school street prior to its launch. As having this evaluation plan in place can calm those with concerns about the pilot. It is also important that we incorporate feedback heard within our community engagement into our evaluation plans, which includes the concerns raised in engagement. For example, we know that community members commonly expressed a concern over traffic displacement onto neighboring streets, and therefore it can be helpful to let the community know that traffic will be monitored and evaluated to determine whether there, the displacement actually occurs. We also found in interviews with team leads that the permit process for the street closure really varied between each municipality as currently there is no standard permit process in place for school streets in Ontario. This is not surprising as school streets are a novel intervention. However, it is interesting to note the different processes that municipalities required. For example, in Markham and Kingston, the street closure permit had to be approved by city council, whereas the city granted the closure permits to Mississauga and Hamilton through a simpler application process. Here you can see Kingston City Council voting unanimously to approve the school street closure in Kingston. We also found that having municipal participation and support for the school street was a key factor for the success of the projects. All of the pilots included in this presentation were either led by or had the support of the municipality. So it's difficult for us to conclude if municipality support is absolutely necessary for the launch of a school street. However, in Kingston and Markham, where both school streets were not led by a municipal department, team leads really stress the importance of having the municipality support for advancing the projects. Our next finding was that team leads found the peer-to-peer -peer support between school streets really helped with the planning process. As school streets are so novel in Ontario and also Canada, there are many challenges faced when trying to launch them. The working group that we at 880 Cities and Green Communities Canada formed was a space where team leads could share challenges and the group could problem solve together. Monthly meetups were held with the school street teams where we also brought in school street implementers from across the country we were able to provide advice and answer questions from school street teams. We found from interviews with our teams that this network of individuals working towards similar goals was imperative to successful project planning. Finally, we found that pilot communities were eager for more opportunities to use their road spaces creatively. The school streets provided communities an opportunity to reimagine the street as a public space that is for more than just cars. Post pilot surveys and engagement boards at the different school streets showed that the communities want more opportunities to use the local roads for events and community building. Now I will pass it back to Gia to present the recommendations that we developed based on these findings. Thanks, Laura. Uh, now I will go, uh, I will tell you our recommendations for future school streets. Uh, we have uh, four general recommendations for you while planning a school street. Uh, first one is to assemble a team with involvement from municipal staff, the city councillor and the school. So uh, one thing we found is that when the city is leading the school street or signed in on as a key partner, 
the resources the team has at their disposal are many and the permit processes uh, also become much simpler when the city is a key partner in the project. Uh, second recommendation is to incorporate the school street within existing active school travel programs. Uh, the, the Markham School Street took place at a school where there was a walking Wednesdays program. And the photos you see on the screen are from Hillside Public School in Mississauga, where they had a school walking routes program. Um, when there are active school travel programs already at the school, you know that there is a culture of walking and cycling to school. And the benefits of active school travel and travel mode shifts will continue to be encouraged uh, in, in those schools after the school street pilot ends. Um, our third recommendation is to animate the school street space. Um, so when you provide programming on the school street uh, itself, uh, that provides additional ways in which children can use the space. And it also encourages children, teachers, and caregivers to engage with each other in that space. And this is quite key when you think about uh, reclaiming streets as public spaces. Uh, the photo on the top right corner is of Storytime Trail at the Hamilton School Street, and children could actually read a story as they walk along. Um, our fourth recommendation is um, to collaborate with like-minded groups across the country to share learnings to support implementation. And we can't stress on this enough. Uh, that is a screenshot from the monthly meetups that we at 880 Cities and GCC hosted for the Ontario School Streets pilot teams. And uh, all the teams gain so much from this sort of support system. Um, so yeah, that is our fourth recommendation. Uh, for community engagement, our recommendation is to prioritize robust uh, community engagement that is meaningful, equitable, accessible, and begins as early in the planning phase as possible. Uh, and these engagement sessions uh, should not just be an info session, but the community should be able to give their input and they should know that, you know, that input will be incorporated into the implementation of the school street. And what's also great about community engagement is that you end up getting these amazing partners for your school street uh, implementation. The Mississauga team was able to include a snack program and a bicycle donation program into their school street project based on community needs that were identified. Uh, for volunteer management, we would recommend uh, a diverse volunteer team, uh, re recruiting a diverse volunteer team. Uh, this firstly helps in community cohesion, but also if your volunteer pool is made up of, you know, uh, different um, age groups like retirees, parents, university and college students, uh, high school students and local community activists, then that means they have varying uh, availabilities and are able to cover different school street shifts. Uh, we also recommend setting aside funds to pay uh, the volunteer coordinator, um, especially if the school street you're running is going to be a long one, uh, like in Kingston or Mississauga. And then for municipalities, uh, we have uh, four recommendations. The first one is that um, uh, the permit processes for temporary road closures uh, should be simplified. Uh, we found that for school streets that were not led by municipalities, it was more challenging uh, to get road closure permits. Um, streets are a public space and we are all here looking to rebalance streets. So we, we recommend that municipalities simplify the uh, permit processes for temporary road closures like school streets. And then we also recommend that the road closure equipment for road closures, uh, including school streets, be standardized. Uh, this will go a long way in helping school streets be more sustainable and easier to implement. Our third recommendation is that municipalities need to support scaling up school streets to longer term pilots. Uh, this is necessary uh, if we want to create longer term behavior change in children. Uh, we also encourage municipalities and school boards to start considering how school streets can be implemented uh, as a more permanent fixture around schools. Um, and our final recommendation is to incorporate school streets into the city's planning policies and strategies. Uh, this will create more accountability for implementation and provides greater legitimacy for school streets. Uh, this should, of course, be accompanied by funding that is set aside for school streets. So uh, those were our recommendations. I, uh, we hope um, this, along with the findings, you know, give you a good start uh, to planning a school street if you are all thinking of uh, planning one or starting one. Uh, and to talk about um, their own experiences running school streets, we have um, the four team leads with us who will join us in a panel discussion. Uh, so we have Callaway Johnson from the city of Hamilton who led the Hamilton School Streets, Rina Mistry from the York Region and York Catholic uh, District School Board 
who led the Markham School Streets, uh, Laura Zeglin from the city of Mississauga, who led the Mississauga School Streets, and Roger Healy from the Kingston Coalition of Active Transportation, who led the Kingston School Streets. Uh, so Callaway, Rena, Laura, and Roger, please turn on your videos and we'll start talking. And now we can also stop sharing the screen. There you go. Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? All right, so now I have some questions prepared for you. Uh, so uh, we, have, we have two rounds of questions uh, and then another one at the end. Uh, but firstly, I have uh, one question each for each team lead. So uh, I'll start with Hamilton. Um, so Callaway, in, in Hamilton, we saw that the school community really embraced the project and started programming the street on their own. Uh, could you tell us how you found this community and how you selected the school for your project? And what advice would you have for finding an ideal site like that? Um, yeah, I'd love to. So um, we ended up taking a, a unique approach of um, working with a counselor to determine the school community we would work with. Um, however, initially we didn't have that approach. approach. We were looking across the city to look at different school sites. And we had done a lot of initial planning for certain sites before confirming those schools. However, after meeting with a counselor that expressed interest in this project, um, she, she suggested the school that um, we ended up working with. Um, after talking to them, they were wanting this type of project before they'd even heard of the idea of a school streets um, program. So they were open arms, accepting and supportive of the project. And um, yeah, we had an amazing turnout at every event and the parents were overjoyed. Um, I think the principal said there was only one single <laughs> negative review, whereas you know, there's two or 300 other positive reviews of the whole um, program from the parents. Um, what would I recommend for, uh, for other groups that are looking to plan this type of project? Um, I would recommend uh, kind of like what I was mentioning we had an initial approach and ended up changing it. I would recommend uh, determining and confirming your school site before doing a lot of the initial planning um, because things are very fluid when you're trying to plan for this type of event. Um, you know, some schools may be better sites than others for this type of street closure. Some schools you know, may be unable to have this type of event. So, you know, determining, coming up with a scale for which schools you could actually work with and then confirming that before you do uh the initial planning i would say is, is pretty key that's great thanks callaway and it really um confirms and or, or reiterates you know how uh a, the, the counselor support or speaking with the counselor who knows the community uh is integral is, is crucial when when you start when you want to pick a, a school for your school street thank you uh rena my next question is to you uh for, about markham school streets so the school street uh, that um, took place in Markham was at a school that had existing school travel planning and active school travel programs. Uh, could you explain how that affected the implementation of school street? Thank you, Gia. Um, yes, I, I definitely think this made the implementation of school streets a lot easier because we had a school who had already built um, some level of active school travel culture. And because of that, um, you know, we really felt that there was a deeper appreciation um, for what we were trying to accomplish through the School Streets project. Um, plus, uh, we not only had the school administration support, uh, we had staff support, we had parents support from, um, you know, champions as well as council. And this really was an added bonus. Um, you know, the staff were able to motivate students. The parents were able to motivate other parents as well as community members. And I think this really goes a long way when you're trying to do um, a project of, of this type of scale. Um, basically, you know, the school sort of had ramped up to this and School Streets was just the next logical step. Um, and so I think our experience um, just ended up being all that more uh, positive. Um, and we had a lot more um, of a, a, I think a, a positive experience um, in implementing the project. Amazing. Thanks, Reina. 
my next question is to you, Laura, from Mississauga. Um, so Mississauga was the only city to implement two school streets at the same time. And we know that you use similar approaches to implement the school street at the two sides. Uh, and But why do you think the two pilots had different outcomes, even though you use the same approach? Yeah, so Mississauga, I think, was a little bit different from some of the other municipalities in terms of how we selected our schools to work with. So it really came down to the school selection. Um, so we took a look at data of every school across the city. So kind of like what Callaway said they were doing at the beginning, um, but we stuck with that approach. So we didn't sort of have other input saying like, oh, you should work with this school. So we were really just looking at the data that we had before we then like approach the counselors, approach the schools to kind of sell them on the idea. Um, and I, I wouldn't say that one was more successful than the other, but they did have different outcomes. So in, in Laura's presentation earlier, she highlighted some of the uh, travel results for Hillside Public School. So that was one of our locations. And our second location was a combination of a Catholic school and a public school that were side by side. Um, so we had this criteria of, you know, all the characteristics of schools that we would want to work with. Um, but we had to kind of bend our criteria a little bit uh, for that second site because we had the Catholic and the public school side by side and we really wanted that combination of those two schools partnering. And they didn't both exactly meet our criteria and we kind of thought we could get away with that. Uh, I, I won't say that it wasn't successful, but we didn't see those same like dramatic uh, differences in uh, shifts towards active transportation um, and also that dispersion of traffic away from the school. So I think this is important for others to know, to keep in mind in terms of what those differences were if you're planning in your own municipality or your own community. Um, so the one thing that we you know, kind of let slide in our criteria for the, the second site was um, they didn't, uh, the Catholic school didn't actually meet our cutoff for the number of students who lived within walking distance of the school. Um, so they had more kids coming from further away and we're like, it's not that big of a school. The public school is all walkers, it should balance out. But there were still a lot of families who were coming from far away who we didn't sell them on the idea of the drive to five, like just park further away. They still wanted to come right to the school. So that did cause some localized congestion at that site. Um, and then the other uh, factor was the street design. So we had set in our criteria that we only wanted to do it on local roads. Um, and we made an exception at the second site using a minor collector road um, it, it is a residential road. There were no businesses. The only really drivers of traffic we thought would be the schools themselves. Um, but what we didn't anticipate was that it's also a route that was used for a lot of drivers cutting through who wanted to avoid a, a major intersection just west of the school. Um, so then when we cut or when we cut that route off by closing the street during the school streets, then we were forcing all those cut through drivers onto narrower local roads that ended at that place where everyone was doing the, the drop off and pick up for the, the Catholic school. So um, we had kind of looked at all of our criteria individually rather than, you know, kind of considering the overall flow of things. So that's one thing that I would, I would say is important is just really understanding how closing one street could impact, um, yeah, the traffic flow in general through the neighborhood. That's not to say that that site wasn't successful at all, but just it was more challenging than the first site. And we didn't see the same sort of dramatic uh, changes in travel modes as we did at Hillside. Got it. Thank you. And that's what pilot projects are for, to test these exactly. things out. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Roger. Um, so a question for you for Kingston. Um, so a big component of your school street was your amazing set of volunteers. And you also, you know, uh, ran it for a whole year. Um, so how did you find your volunteers and how did you manage them and sustain them throughout the duration of your year long school street? Uh, yeah, thanks, Gia. Um, yeah, uh, first of all, I guess uh, we, we, we started with a roster of about 40 volunteers. We acquired that roster by a combination of uh, advertising posters among uh, across the city. Uh, but uh, a lot of it was word of mouth, of course, and and you know you have to use all those channels. Uh, we we needed it. We thought we needed a big group of volunteers because we'd initially set up a bigger school street area. But in the end, it, the the we ended up with quite a few volunteers. They all stayed with us, and um, 
but the the notion was we would have only need for them one or two shifts a week and and that worked out really well so i think i think that was part of the you know we had as you mentioned a full year to deal with so we had to worry about keeping the the roster uh up uh they were very committed to the whole concept of of the school street um they, I think over time, they saw the some of those second, second order benefits that were mentioned at the beginning, like air quality and quiet and calm and, and social times and social interactions and that kind of stuff. I think the, the volunteers saw that. And, uh, um, and, and at that time, of course, many had the flexibility of of they were working from home. So if they were parents or neighbors, they could, they could do a shift and they really enjoyed the break. Uh, it was a one hour commitment. That was it, you know, from start to finish. It was really only 25 minutes on, on site, of course, but um, set up and break down and getting there and back. Uh, we had, we hired, and we were very lucky to have a hired a coordinator who, who helped monitor these 40, shifts and every week uh, published a schedule and everyone would say oh yeah I can't do this Tuesday morning and all that kind of stuff having someone to do that was really cr crucial and uh, we were quite lucky to get that sorted out um, and uh, I think the the overall look of the project was looked like it was well planned and that was helpful to attract and retain volunteers so that's it, basically, in a nutshell. We were we were just very lucky to have uh, good, dedicated volunteers, and and it's hard to rely on them all the time, but it helps to nurture them and support them. Hundred percent. And uh, Roger, could you also um, like let us know how you found your volunteers? Like, how, uh, what sort of outreach did you do to get your volunteers? Uh, well, as I mentioned, we had some some posters that we put up uh, mainly on the university campus, and we had a really nice mix of of local neighbors. So we went door to door and and handed out information about the school street. And in the mean and and on the way by, had you know, uh, here's here's a way you can volunteer if you're interested. Um, we put up the posters through the campus and all around the community. And and with we had QR codes and we had uh, email addresses for the school street operation and so um, that really helped I think uh, give a connection to to our project specifically. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and my my next question is a general question to all of you. Um, and the question is, what has been the biggest highlight of piloting school streets in your community? And uh, for this, uh, we'll start with you, Roger, and then uh, head our way back. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, well, uh, I, I really think, uh, I think the highlight to me, being a full year project, was, was just kind of seeing the concept become a reality. Um, it, the whole project was brought to us by Dr. Patricia Collins from Queens and working with, she was starting up a project with, called Leveling the Playing Fields with a uh, professor colleague at, at uh, University of Montreal. And, and it, it was involving a twinning uh, arrangement with, with, uh, uh, with Kate Froelich at University of Montreal. And so we, that brought to it also uh, an important concept of, of evaluating everything. Uh, you know, measuring as much as we could and and seeing where we were going with this. Um, and uh, so KCAT took on the role of just implementing it, but we had a lot, or I just mentioned our, our volunteers, we had uh, good cooperation with the city and the school principal. Uh, that was really crucial to making this work. Um, but it was, it was, it was just so important to keep addressing the skeptics because there's a lot of skeptics and they, they just kept saying, oh, this will never work. What are you doing this for? You know, we don't need this. And, um, and it was just gratifying to see, you know, the skeptics do 180s and say, this is a great, great plan. So keep it up, you know, and, um, it, you know, and we persisted with, despite quite a few setbacks, and, you know, it's 10 months, 176 school days, who's counting, um, but uh, 
We also remember picked a, an ideal site, I think, and that's important for piloting is that you want it to be successful. You want it to, you want to pick a, a school that that's ready for this and it it's easy to implement. And of course, uh, you know, lastly, you know, the, the, so the, the best part of that highlight, I think it was, you know, seeing it happen and, um, and seeing it carry on, I think that, and the, the fact that people want to carry on. So that's, that's very encouraging. That's so good to hear. Thank you, Raja. I will go to you, Laura, next. What is your biggest highlight? Um, so similar to Roger, it, I think a highlight was seeing the data, like the objectively collected data that showed that we weren't just pushing the traffic elsewhere, that it actually was dissipating and seeing that there were increases in active transportation, not just amongst um, students, but in general, we we're seeing more people walking and biking through the area. I think they sort of thought like, oh, cool, like I could come down this route with my bike that's not normally a bike route and I can just ride down the middle of the road, which is cool. Um, and you know, uh, having something to, to say to people whose initial, because I think a lot of people's initial reaction when they hear about school streets is just that you're just pushing the problem elsewhere. It's not going to solve anything. And to be able to actually point to actually, it kind of did. <laughs> like we did see a shift and it's not just based on, because I like the idea, like we have traffic counts and we have observational data and all these things. So that was really cool. Um, and then another highlight for me was the opportunity for community engagement, not just for me, but I think a lot of the people involved on our team, um, because this is something that's at this point still pretty novel um, and exciting. It was a really good way to bring in different members of, of the local communities, not just at the schools themselves, um, particularly at our St. Alfred and Brian Fleming site, the community service workers, um, different People who worked at different programs within the school had all these connections to outside of the school as well, who brought in a lot of people who wanted to volunteer, which was really great. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of a big splashy thing. It's a great opportunity to bring people on board um, to be involved in something that they might not otherwise, you know, come together to be involved in something like that. So yeah. That's amazing. Thank you. And how about you, Rina, in Markham? What was your biggest highlight? So similarly, to be honest, watching this whole thing come alive, um, you know, we talked, we joked about this a few years ago and to see this actually come alive and to see this tool, you know, now a part of our toolbox. Um, yeah, there's a sense of gratification. Um, you know, each week, the first week, you know, there was some participation, but as each day went on um, with the implementation of school streets to see more and more students to see more and more community members participate and engage I think that was also um, really positive and to see sort of our, our school and our, our sort of selected area turn into sort of that social space was also um, really positive um, you know the other thing I want to say is we spoke to all the residents who, who live um, on the street directly adjacent to the school and not one person had a negative thing to say in fact you know, we were hearing we anything to keep the kids safe and they could really s sort of start to see how this tool, um, you know, had those benefits and was bringing a lot more um, sort of safety around the school zone. Um, the other pieces I know, um, you know, you, you've mentioned uh, we had a really great working relationship with our uh, partners and um, you know, this relationship is only growing and there's more appetite from our municipal partners, uh, as well as the school to want to do it again. And I think that's another big highlight and just sort of success point for us to, to sort of say, you know, um, it, it wasn't that disruptive, it was actually uh, effective and um, let's do more. So the appetite to do more is, I think, definitely another highlight for us. That's so good to hear. And Callaway, what about in Hamilton? What was the biggest highlight? Um, yeah, I guess to start, like, um, I think that back in 2019, I believe it was, when our, our team attended one of the 880 Cities webinars about this type of uh, event, um, I, I remember, we, I mean, I think our team was definitely skeptics of the whole, uh, the whole program, thinking, like, kind of what Roger was saying, definitely skeptics, and thinking, you know, maybe it's not really possible in Hamilton, like, what would look like in an urban setting, um, things like that. Um, so I think the biggest highlight for us was um, just doing it, seeing the reaction from the community, and then kind of realizing that like it's it's definitely possible, like especially in Hamilton, like widespread to bring it to many many more schools. Um, 
that was my biggest highlight is kind of becoming a champion of it, <laughs> starting from a skeptic. skeptic. Um, but beyond that, I think like everyone's mentioned um, in their response is like, just seeing like the moment the barriers were placed on the street, just the crowd kind of <laughs> filtering from the school property out onto the street and just kind of watching it uh, kind of morph and, and, and be animated through the, through the kids. Like they brought jump ropes, balls, games, stuff like that. And just watching it turn into almost like a park like within 30 seconds was was pretty incredible. Yeah, I agree. And I was there at one of uh, like some of your projects and it was uh, so fun to see the street, you know, changing its um, uh, its vibe uh, totally. All right. So, um, Laura, I will pass it to you to uh, for the audience Q&A. I can see the Q&A is uh, popping. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of great questions here. So. Yeah. I'll start us off um, with a question from an anonymous attendee um, asking if any of the school streets are still going or if there's plans for them to be repeated. So I'll start this with Roger and then if others want to um, comment after about any plans for the future. Um, Roger, are yeah. there any pilots still going? Yeah, in fact, uh, we were, you know, it was so successful, I think, that uh, the city and and the school boards are quite interested in in the whole thing expanding. So uh, we through the level of, level of playing fields project uh, with Dr. Collins and, and Froelich, they they intended to do in a subsequent year, the next year one anyway, uh, in a different school. And so we uh, the city uh, and and school board encouraged us to keep running Winston because, uh, you know, the whole th thought of it stopping was kind of, yeah, scary to them because they would probably get a lot of backlash. Um, but they just wanted to keep a good thing going um, and wanted to, in their cases, learn more about the, you know, it was sort of going from a pilot to a, a next stage where it was really kind of operational. And, uh, and it's important for them to kind of learn all the little nuances of that. So we agreed to do it um, with some support from, from them, financial support from them. Um, and then we, all, we started a second school as part of the leveling the playing field project. And, and they were quite happy with that second school at uh, Central Public, which is more downtown and, and a core school, core city school, but uh, different, in many cases, very simple as, and easy as well. So, and a good supportive community, uh, parent community. So uh, it, it's being run by one of the parent champions in that school. So great. Uh, yeah, they have carried on, and and I think uh, I think we'll see more of them. It's it's kind of important for the city to understand that this is different from their typical, you know, speed bumps, uh, uh, sort of physical traffic calming notions of you know uh, narrowing the streets and all the things that they that they know work or think work <laughs> but they don't they don't really work in a lot of cases and and, uh, and I think that's that's what we have to uh, sort of promote is that this is a, a different notion of just closing the street for the critical time and and it makes things a lot safer and quieter in the long run so. great thank you Rena Laura Calloway any any plans for the future am I allowed to ask Roger a question sure <laughs> up to that because we're trying to figure out how we can um, scale it to be able to continue it in Mississauga, but we had a big, I'd say our biggest challenge in our pilot was the volunteer piece. Um, yeah. So just getting enough volunteers um, because we also were escorting um, residents who lived within the, the closure area if they needed to get to and from their driveways. That was kind of like one of the exceptions we had to make and our volunteers seem to spend a lot of time walking with cars. We can't not have volunteers. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so Roger, are you guys still doing the chaperone thing of walking cars? Um, and yeah. how, how are you managing the volunteers? <laughs> well, it's the same issues. Yeah, you're right. We still, we need the same roster of volunteers. There's been naturally some turnover. Uh, some were not available a second year. You know, I mentioned the work, you know, work from home situation changed. And, um, but, but we've still got a pretty solid core volunteers and we still do that 
but ironically, I, you know, I don't, I don't think volunteers maybe are in, if you roll it out citywide, is the real solution because mm -hmm. some communities can't, can't access volunteers as readily as others. And, and it's just a, it's a very intensive pro project to, to, um, uh, monitor it and, and, and roll and operationalize it. But the, the nice thing, of course, from the point of view of the city and the school boards is it's free or it's close to free. So let's just keep doing that. But, you know, the, in reality, I, I just don't think it, it's sustainable over a longer period in a, in a bigger area. So uh, we have to really bite the bullet and just say, OK, how do we fund this? Because it's much like a, the, the model of a, a, a crossing guard, which many cities and school boards employ, just redeploy them to the school street concept. And and uh, it, to me, it's a it's a it's a real no brainer to just operationalize it that way. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks, Roger. And Laura, any plans for the future? Uh, it's to be determined based on the volunteer question. That's why. I'm right. <laughs> right. Advice. Great. Thanks. Um, and also, Rena? Yeah, I'll yeah. In. Um, yeah, so definitely um, we're looking at doing another school streets project probably around the same time of year in May, but um, we had sort of started with the walking Wednesdays and attaching um, our, our days to Wednesdays, but I think this time we're looking at doing um, you know, three to four consecutive weeks. Um, and then as uh, sort of just building on Laura and, and Roger's point, um, we are looking into that piece as well, because we also feel that the volunteer piece just long-term wise may not be sustainable, um, but are there other avenues that we can consider? Maybe it's an EA from a school, maybe it's the crossing guard, as you mentioned. So I think those are just some discussions and planning that have to take place, but um, I think we're definitely looking to move forward uh, with a second implementation, um, either at the same school or we may consider um, something something a little bit different if we want to maybe um, learn something a little bit different when it comes to um, how a community is sort of set up. Great. Okay, so I'll move to our next question. Um, and so someone else asked, are homeowners living in the active school zone part of the decision making process? Negative comments about the school zone seem to be glossed over. What percentage of homeowners living in, I guess, on the school street um, were unhappy with the school street? So, Rena, you mentioned that after the pilot, you talked to the homeowners. Um, did you want to speak sure. on that again? Yeah. Sure. Um, so, and you know, we actually spoke to them before as well. We, I went door to door, literally, with a, another sort of volunteer from our group. Um, and a lot of them, you know, didn't actually understand, I think, what the concept was, although we did send out um, mailing letters, um, as well as had built, like for boards around the community went right across the street. Um, but I think they just didn't actually understand until it actually started happening. Um, and then once they saw it again, we did um, another door to door um, to the same houses. So we there were 15 um, homeowners that were sort of impacted. Um, every single person, once they had saw sort of how it works, um, you know, I think realized that it didn't actually impact them um, in, in very, uh, or it impacted them very little because we, we also had the escorting going on. Um, but I think a lot of them also mentioned that they were also able to sort of, um, you know, sort of alter their schedules a little bit. It was a short time um, that the road was closed. And, you know, if they had left five minutes or, or just five minutes before or five minutes after, you know, it didn't impact them at all. And um, again, I think the fact that it also was like the, the safety, the piece that they saw, um, because even living on the short sort of strip in the morning without the school streets, they were noticing cars sort of whipping by. Um, and even, you know, some of the students who just live across the street, but sometimes it would be a challenge to just cross the street. But the fact that they could hear birds chirping in the morning on those days, um, you know, they really just saw um, the impacts of this. And um, I think definitely, again, as I said, they said that they would have no problem supporting this project in the future. Yeah, Laura Zeglin. So I, we had a little bit of a different experience um, in the streets that um, we did this on in Mississauga. And I did wanna raise it because I don't wanna be glossing over and saying that you're not gonna face any challenges. Um, I think an important, 
like part of the preparation for this. So all of the, the like as much outreach as you can do to the community and like to get it as like obvious to people as possible that something is happening so they can be prepared, being very transparent about where they can reach out if they have questions or concerns. Because some of the concerns that came up were then addressed um, like once someone reached out to ask the question, they realized, oh, that's not as big of an issue. Or sometimes it act, we, we then try to plan around it, right? Like, okay, this is gonna be an issue. So how can we troubleshoot? So you can do that through reaching out early. But ultimately, like, I think no matter where you go, you're gonna have some people who just don't like it. And for whatever, like it's their core beliefs that this is not what, what you should do with the road. It doesn't matter how well planned, how well communicated it is. It's really important to have your counselor support and the backup of, you know, the higher ups who can stand behind you. If, if someone gets really angry about it, just be like, you know, we support it because it aligns with vision zero. It aligns with, you know, our, our health goals, whatever it is, right. To be able to stand behind you because there will be people who aren't going to like it um, even no matter how well you do it. So yeah, something to be prepared for. I, I don't want to make it sound like it's all smooth sailing. It's all sunshine and rainbows. There are definitely challenges. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we had the same thing. Uh, and of course, running it every day, it, it, it did, as Rena mentioned, you know, people had do, did adjust their schedules, I think. There were only nine households uh, contained in our closed school street. So uh, you know, we were lucky in that sense that it was a smaller number and we could develop a, a you know, recognize their cars, try to, you know, accommodate them as quickly as possible. And so that, uh, but, but, you know, the, yeah, there, there will be people as Laura Ziegler was saying, are just, they're dead set against it and they are not likely to change. And uh, I don't know if, if you saw this Callaway at, at your place, if, if you involved a lot of residents, even I'm not sure of your setup, but uh, that's that's just par for the course. And the city was very good at at supporting us, uh, you know, making sure they that any if anyone complained to them, they made sure that uh, yeah, this is a legitimate street closure and it's got our permission and all the councilors approved it and all that sort of stuff. So so we had backup, and. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it really settled down, I, I have to say. I mean, the, the people who had complaints just finally realized, hey, this is not a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Callaway, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with what everyone else saying is that like, there's no way you can avoid uh, having some people that are upset <laughs> at the street closure. Um, but I think like having uh, the point of contact there to that, that have, you know, knows about the permit and can direct the those inquiries to that person. Um, you know, for our event, that was me. So the school wasn't taking any onus of responding to, uh, you know, any any neighbors that were uh, unhappy about the about the closure. Um, that being said, we we didn't have any negative response from the um, street we were on. We had two mid-rise uh, apartment buildings that are directly across from the school, and they were the only two residential buildings that were within our school streets closure. Um, and within that, they didn't even have a parking lot like through this, through the, um, on the street. So um, all we had to really deal with as far as vehicle traffic goes is like a few cars that were um, parked within the school street. And those cars were the same cars every single Tuesday that we ran the event. And so after the first Tuesday, you know, we actually, we spoke to the owners of the vehicles, like only one of them came out to see what was going on. And you know, then we were able to, you know, drive the point down that it was going to happen every Tuesday for in June and during these times only. And yeah, I mean, you know, I think we were lucky that we didn't have uh, any negative feedback, but I, I definitely think that it's, it's very dependent on the school site. And I wouldn't have been surprised if, if someone had complained. But yeah, it's part for the course, as Roger said. Yeah, to be expected, I suppose. Um, Quickly on that note, um, I know there's a couple questions in the chat about how did you accommodate residents who had driveways on the closed street? Um, does anyone want to quickly answer that? Callaway, uh, you said there's no driveways in yours, so, um, or few, so maybe Laura or Rena, do you want to? Yeah, I can jump in. So we basically copied Kingston. So uh, <laughs> Kingston had a, a program where um, they had in Mississauga, we called them chaperones. So some of our volunteers were assigned as chaperones. So we basically were patrolling the street, watching for if anyone was leaving a driveway. 
Um, and then they would travel at walking speed with a chaperone and we tried to be very friendly, just like chat with the people as we went. And same thing coming in, um, we gave out, well, we gave out passes. I don't know that that's necessary for a longer term project, but just the people could put it on their dashboard. They didn't have to explain who they were, where they're going. We're like, okay, yeah, you're a resident. And then same thing, we would walk them to their driveway. Um, and a couple other exceptions we made um, were for families um, who had identified that they either the caregiver or the student had special needs and wasn't coming in by school bus and it was like an accessibility thing that we like they they spoke to the principal about that and then the principal said okay yeah so we'll give out these passes to these families just to make sure that there wasn't anybody who like, you now couldn't come to school because the road was closed we had to make exceptions for that and other than that those were our only exceptions great yeah, similarly, uh, we copied Kingston as well, and we had chaperones. <laughs> uh, we had two volunteers for our street um, who would walk up and down. Um, we did ask the residents to sort of like wave us down when they were wanted to leave. Um, and then we also had a volunteer um, at the end that was open um, to allow staff in um, and then also allow the residents out uh, when necessary. Great. Thank you so much. Roger, anything you want to add quickly? Uh, no, just that, again, I mentioned we only had a few. We had nine, mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, we, we issued little mirror hanger tags for them so that if they were entering the street, coming from wherever they were shopping or whatever, and came onto the street, we at least the volunteers could recognize them, not grill them about what they were doing <laughs> Uh, and they'd move the barrier quickly and 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 the other if they were leaving their home during the school street we would they would either signal to us as Rena said and and honk their horn or something and and we were always watching for for that movement and yeah. run over with a chaperone and get them out of there because the least can inconvenience the better you know for them and yeah. for us because we, didn't, we didn't certainly I think overall our stats were something like two cars per shift yeah in school street so that you know you have, want to keep that number as low as possible because otherwise what's the point of having a school street if, if there's mm -hmm. cars streaming in and out so yeah um, so so it's really important to keep it as low as possible right thank you roger um so i know there's a lot of questions we didn't get to we will be following up by email answering the rest of the questions that we received in the chat so the email that you registered for the webinar with we will follow up um, responding to those questions um, I'll pass it back to Gia for our final questions to the panelists to wrap up this session. Thank you, Laura. Time flies when you talk about school streets, I guess. <laughs> uh, okay, all right, uh, Laura, Rina, Callaway, and Roger. I have one last question for you. So the question is, in one sentence, what do you think is needed to advance school streets in Ontario? So who, do, who wants to go first? Callaway, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, in one sentence, I would say uh, some sort of policy in place would would be what needs to happen to advance it in Ontario. Awesome. Thank you. Rina? Um, I think school boards and municipalities need to work closely together in partnership and see school streets as a viable and practical tool as part of their toolbox for combating um, school zone safety and active school travel. Um, you know, it, it's not only beneficial for students, it's also beneficial for the residents. Um, and then I'm gonna do two sentences. I also think that you need um, champions at the school, at the community and at the government level who are willing to try and sort of test and build on these tools um, in order for these things to advance. Thank you, Laura. Sure, so I'll build on, on that. Um, I think what's needed is willingness and leadership from our local governments to prioritize the needs of children and other vulnerable road users over convenience for drivers. Thank you, Roger. I can't add any, any more to that. I think that sums it up, really. That's that's exactly what I would have said. Um, and, and, you know, just have the school boards and city officials not sort of arguing about whose problem it is and just get on with it and figure it out. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being part of this panel discussion. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, all the very best in continuing these uh, initiatives in your communities. And it was super uh, fun to collaborate with you all. I hope this collaboration continues and we see more of these school streets in our communities. Um, can we have the slides back again?
Thank you, Shurin. Um, thanks, everyone. So um, just as a concluding comment, uh, we know that school streets can increase active school travel, improve air quality, and increase social connections. But it is also an opportunity to engage with schools and the community uh, on road safety and reimagining our streets, to actually reimagine our streets as a space of joy where children can uh, children who walk and cycle and roll are prioritized. And uh, uh, I, I hope you know, you're all inspired by this discussion and that we don't remain uh, idle uh, and let our school zones be polluted um, and you know, put our children at risk of injury and fatality. Uh, I hope we can all take some action to prioritize children's uh, right to move safely in their communities in a way that not only supports their individual health and well-being, but the health and well-being of their uh, of the community and planet as well. Uh, and before we wrap up, uh, I just wanted to quickly share a few things. We will soon have a school streets toolkit, uh, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, we will be sharing it on our school streets webpage on the 880 Cities website. Uh, this page has a few helpful resources on school streets, so please do check it out. Um, and lastly, we are keen to establish a community of practice for school streets in Canada. Like we mentioned before, the monthly meetups we hosted for the teams piloting school streets was a great resource for all the teams. Uh, and it was also um, a recommendation that came out of the report. So we would like to expand this group and keep it going. And so we're looking for funding to do this very important work. If any of you know of such funding, uh, do reach out to us. And that's all from us, folks. Thank you, everyone, for your attention and participation in this session. Uh, and a huge thank you to uh, all the presenters and all the panelists. Thank you so much. <laughs>